J.W. Rogers, Not Dead, War Crystal. You've seen the old V-mail letters. Oh, yeah. back up and enrolled in the university and I was in the student union and uh, looked up there on the memorial board mm -hmm. they had for the, those killed in action and there, there was my name <laughs> up there on that board. <laughs> I said, said that I, I better get that taken off or I might not ever get a degree from here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of my kids and grandkids, uh, I made tapes as I was traveling down the road in the car, uh, just uh, about my uh, experience of, in being shot down and captured and, and uh, some of the experiences in, in uh, EW life there. Uh, that uh, is not quite complete. I have a, a couple of, uh, of the tapes finished, but uh, I'm on the third one, and it's not quite through, we just haven't, haven't really edited it that yeah. early yet. But uh, she wanted me to do it so she could put it down on the computer and, and run off copies for the kids or something like that. Oh, that's good, yeah. And then the uh, Hughes County Historical Society have been after me to give a uh, prepare a history of my family for the uh, Hughes County Historical Society. My family here in, in Hughes County, they were old pioneers in, in the county. They're trying to get all the, old, the older yeah. families kind of documented and what they did. And then they go back and cross-check one against the other when they're looking for history and, and uh, work it out. Okay, today is July 14th. 1987. My name is Joe Todd, and this is an interview with James W. Rogers, Jr. in Holmanville, Oklahoma. Uh, no, my last check. Mr. Rogers, where were you born? I was born in Holmanville on uh, September the 30th, 1917. 1917. Who was your father? James W. Rogers, Sr. Mother. My mother was Tasca Powell Rogers. Tasca Powell. T A S K A. And where were your parents from? Uh, my uh, father was from Southwest Missouri, and uh, my mother originally was from Kentucky, Winchester, Kentucky. Did they ever say why their families moved to uh, Oklahoma? Uh, my mother 
uh, came because her father uh, just wanted to come out here and, and pioneer, and uh, they moved here in 1903 from Kentucky. Uh, my uh, mother's mother had passed away, and my and uh, her father had married again, and, and they uh, bought some farmland here and, and uh, uh, settled in right near Holdenville. In fact, we still own the place that they originally. Uh, bought. Now, did they buy the land before or after statehood? It was before statehood. My mother came here in, in 1903. My father was uh, working with the uh, Interior Department with the Indians. He was a United States uh, Indian agent and field clerk at that time and was sent here out of the Muscogee office to look after the Creeks and Seminoles. Uh, and he uh, uh, studied law uh, during the time he was working for the government and uh, was admitted to the bar in, in 1912. And uh, he still stayed with the government until about uh, World War I and then went out on his own practicing law after, after World War I. Was he a lawyer with the Indian Service? He was a lawyer at the time he was with the Indian Service, but not when he started with them. Yeah. He, he came here in 1909 and uh, received his law degree in 1912. That was the year that he married my mother. From the uh, University of Oklahoma? No, it was, uh, it, his, his law degree was from the University of Chicago, but it was by, done, the work was done mostly by correspondence. Mm -hmm. Did your mother's family have to get permission to enter Indian territory? No, no. The, uh, the town of Holdenville had, had already been um, uh, platted and settled to a great extent at uh, the time she moved here, and and their place was bought from the Indians. The, when an allotted uh, when an Indian who had allotted land died, they could sell through the court, sell their land, and it had been bought from the Indians directly. Because I was going to ask about, you know, purchasing land before statehood you know, for the Indians. Uh, do you know if any of your grandparents or great-grandparents was involved in the Civil War? Yes, my uh, uh, great-grandfather on my uh, father's side was involved in the Civil War, and to what extent, I really uh, don't know. I just heard the the uh, stories of him being, uh, I think he was fought for the Confederacy. What was his name? Uh, let's see, my grandfather's name was Jesse. I can't tell you <laughs> that right now, but I, I've got the I've got the history uh, written down. My dad uh, made a little genealogy genealogical sketch for me and took the family way back. Uh, I believe it was William Green Rogers. And, uh, that's the best I, I can remember. Okay. Um, could you give a description of Holdenville from a child's point of view? From the south point of view? From a child's point oh, of view. Oh, from a child's point small of view. Board. What did the town look like? Mm, well, it was a rather a progressive town. Uh, see, it, child point of view, and I'm, I'm talking from, from the standpoint of the 1920s, uh, going, uh, going to school. My parents lived at the edge of, in this, in this same plot, a plot that we own, a 40-acre tract of land that we own, which was about a mile out of town at that time. So at, when I became old enough to go to school, they moved into a house which we bought in on uh, North Hinckley Street in, in Holdenville, uh, 400 block, and uh, uh, there was only two houses on the block at that time, and uh, it was the main thoroughfare in the, in the town from the uh, rural area and was, uh, at that time, uh, federal highways were just getting platted through the country and was on a federal highway, which was 270. Uh, 
US 270. And uh, uh, I walked, like I say, my parents moved in town so I could be where I could be within walking distance of school. Walked to school, which was just about five blocks from, from my home. Uh, and, and went to central grade school here in Holdenville and then uh, went to high school and junior high, at, which was combined at the uh, uh, Holdenville High School, which was just two blocks from, from my home. And uh, uh, when I went into junior high school, the year I went into junior high school, uh, the high school burned down. And, and very vivid recollections of, of uh, that time. And, and for a while, we were going to school in church basements and, and uh, things like that. But the town at that time was a sort of a boom town with the oil business uh, booming and the Seminole oil fields uh, being developed. Uh, and everybody was uh, seemed to be prosperous. And my, <clears throat> my father was at, at the point where he was, he was uh, uh, buying a farm here and a tract of land here and mineral rights here. And he had mortgaged one to buy the other, buy the next one, and uh, he got caught in the, in the depression in 1929 when he had overextended himself. And and uh, being a lawyer, you didn't uh, have a regular income. Uh, you your clients paid you off in, in the depression with with chickens and eggs and hams and <laughs> and this that and the other, just like they used to in the, the doctors when they. Uh, they didn't have any money to, to pay you. So uh, uh, he lost nearly everything he had in, in the Depression. And uh, uh, I graduated from high school in 1934. And my sister uh, graduate, had graduated in 1931 from Holdenville High School. Let me ask, uh, could you describe the change in Holdenville before the oil boom and during the oil boom? How did the oil boom affect the town? Oh, it was uh, a very, very progressive town during the oil boom. And then after the uh, Depression hit, see, we had in 1930, in the, in the census here in Holdenville, we had peaked out at about uh, 7,500, a little more than 7,500 people in Holdenville. And uh, we had approximately, I'd say, 28,000 people in the county. And after that, the people migrated out, and we became a very, very conservative community. And I'll tell you how it affects a small town like this. The the generation of the wildcatters and, and the uh, liberals that go out and, and the doers uh, that went broke during the Depression left their mark on their children who went through all of this and they, they became very cautious and conservative from the start. And those that were able to survive and stay here were the people that had the money to, to begin with primarily. It wasn't true in my family's case because my my father was a Republican, and he's just conservative uh, all the way. And uh, and he uh, uh, he never accumulated any wealth to speak of. He he uh, just had a had a good living. And uh, uh, but those that those families that uh, were uh, in the oil business and there were the wildcatters, some of their their children stayed in the oil business. But they wouldn't wildcat. They they would go put a deal together and they maybe keep a little bit of it, and and sell the rest of it out and uh, you know in a conservative manner. And uh, and most of those people that made their money, their children lived off of that money for the uh, and and didn't do anything towards making the town more progressive. Didn't. They, they they had it. They and it's sort of like anybody that that once they 
they accumulate wealth. If, they, if there's any great change, they might lose their wealth. And uh, so consequently, they were, they were very conservative. And, and then those people, the grandchildren of those wildcatters, saw that you had to be progressive. You had to, had to get out and do these things. And, and they didn't see any, any hope for any success in a small town like this, and they left. So all we had had left here in, in the community were the conservative elements, and anyone who who was really progressive was would be a person that had move uh, that had to move in here for for some reason. Or other. When did the oil boom begin? In well, it was going on in the or in the early 20s, in in 1922 and 23. I of course I don't remember it that well myself, but from examining abstracts and. Uh, in the course of my business, I find all of this activity uh, going on. And we had, uh, in Oldenville, we had some of the most progressive back in the early days citizens. We had uh, J.A. Chapman, who became one of the wealthiest persons in, in the world, and left here and went to uh, Tulsa. He discovered the Glen Pool up, up at Tulsa. and. Uh, uh, was a major stockholder in, in Mobile Oil Corporation, and uh, he has yet four ranches around Holdenville. They love the love the land. And was it C.R. Anthony from Holdenville? Who? Yes, yeah, C.R. Anthony was. He was raised in the area between Holdenville and Weewoka. Uh, my uh, mother knew him as Ross. <laughs> they were old old high school friends or something, and. Uh, uh, then uh, this uh, Rogers, that uh, uh, John Rogers, that was uh, with Chapman all of his life, he came from Holdenville. Uh, McFarlane, who was the the father-in-law of uh, of uh, Jim Chapman, and Bob Mc R. B. McFarlane, you know maybe you know the McFarlane Memorial Church in Norman. It was he was the one that built built that for them. And uh, you look at, at, at the aldermen in the old original council, and you find uh, a bunch of these. V.V. Harris in Oklahoma City, one of the wealthiest uh, people in Oklahoma City for a time, was originally from Holdenville. Uh, S.J. Sarkis, uh, the Sarkis Foundation, was from Holdenville. Got his start trading in Indian land. Uh, buying mineral rights uh, in this area, and uh, 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 just people like that are, are scattered out all over. Uh, the uh, the background I don't know. Uh, they they found out when they that they had to move where the action was, and they moved to the big city. I'd like to ask, who was was there a Holden family here? The town it was after? Uh, as the history. Uh, tells us, I think, he was uh, an agent for the Rock Island Railroad. Now, I might be wrong about this. Uh, back uh, in the 1890s, just about the time of the settlement here, and uh, it was named after him. Uh, G.W. McShann was an old pioneer, uh, and that is the story, I think, that he, he related. His family still owns uh, uh, lots of the downtown area. In, in, uh, Oldenville. But though, what I was trying to say, those people were so progressive. Uh, to give you an example, uh, they they built a, a bridge across the South Canadian River uh, through the funds of the city of Holdenville in order to get the farmers across that river into Holdenville and to trade in, in the city. Then later on, we built one of the larger lakes at that time in the, in the state of Oklahoma for our, uh, our own uh, water supply, and uh, it's, it's still down there, and, and uh, we, we still use it. Uh, it's been adequate for everything that we need all, all these years, but they were, they were really 
progressive in their in their thinking. At what that time, time period was the bridge? All oh, around uh, that was before 1920 when the bridge was built. It washed out in uh, 1937 in a flood, I think, at, at, uh, or heavy rainfall, and it took us years to get the get the state to replace it. And, uh, uh, now. Uh, you know, after having built the dam there, and the road goes across, the highway goes across the dam for the for the city lake, uh, to show you how we become dependent upon the state and federal government to do these things for us, uh, we find that the dam is is uh, leaking a little bit, and and the, we go to the state, and say, hey, your road. The, the, the dam over which your road goes is leaking, and you better fix it. <laughs> Instead of us trying to to do the fixing ourselves, you know. So after your father lost most everything in the Depression, how did the family survive? Well, actually, we had uh, we had very little. I, I can remember eat my evening meal would be mush and milk. Many, many times, we just glad to have that. Uh, the, uh, everyone was working, uh, trying to help whatever way they could, and uh, I would work after after school and on Saturdays at the grocery store. I worked from six o'clock in the morning till ten o'clock at night, and made a dollar and a half, and uh, just proud to have that, you know. Uh, and we didn't have, I didn't, my dad didn't have money to, to send me through college. Uh, he helped me my first year in college, and I worked the rest of the way. And uh, he just couldn't afford it. And uh, I, I remember um, one year I, I enrolled at OU, and, and uh, uh, I had 10 cents in my pocket when I went through the line to, to enroll. And this was in the heart of, about 1937, I think, in the heart of uh, the Depression. Uh, and when I got through enrolling, they, they said, you, uh, you, you pay here. And I said, well, I don't have money. They said, well, in that case, you go through here. <laughs> it was a, there was a lot of people that, that didn't have the money, and, and we went in there and signed a note for it for ourselves. And, and uh, I went down to the campus corner and got a job working for uh, by the hour, and went to, uh, to the union cafeteria and, and got a job for my meals. And the lady that I stayed with let me work for my for my room. And it was nine weeks into the semester before I had enough money to buy all my books. And, and this is in 37? 37, 37, yes. Did you, what year did you graduate from the University of Oklahoma? Well, I, I graduated after the war, I had 120 hours before before the war, but I didn't have a degree at that time. So after the war, you could get a combined degree uh, through the university at that time, and I didn't know really whether I wanted to be a, uh, whether I, I wanted to study enough. You know, after the war, I I went in and talked to the dean of the law school, and he said, well, maybe you ought to go another semester and in arts and science school, just to see whether you you can adapt to it, and if you do, fine. And I went to the semester and made above the average, I guess, in there. And he said, "Well, that's fine. You you'll make it all right." And I went through the law school there just straight through, a little over two years. After that. What was your major when you entered? In the government, you? English. And. Uh, would you give me your reflections on Pearl Harbor Day? Oh yeah, I can remember it very, very uh, clearly. Um, it was, I guess, after or during church that I found out uh, about it. The, uh, it, it, you know, we didn't realize at that time the signif the complete significance, but. It, uh, I was, uh, in 1941, see, I was uh, 20, 
four years old. And uh, uh, I, uh, I realized that we were in a war and that uh, our whole lives were going to be changed one way or the other. And uh, uh, I had been, uh, well, there's, there's a lot of history before this, you know, uh, the draft was going on uh, before the war, before Pearl Harbor. In 1940, I had uh, uh, I had dropped out of college without receiving my my degree because I I didn't think my majors were going to do me any good and and uh, uh, I was just trying to find out what I wanted to do primarily. And I went out to California and went to work for uh, J C Penney store out there in Oxnard, California. And while I was out there, they it came time to register for the draft, so I registered from Holdenville, Oklahoma, so that if I was drafted, I'd go with the people I was raised with. And uh, I was the first one drafted uh, in the first group that was drafted. There were three of us left from Holdenville on, uh, no, it was about the, seemed like it was about the 2nd or 3rd of February in 1941. That's before Pearl Harbor in December the 7th, 1941. 41. And uh, uh, the American Legion threw us a big party the night before, and being the first group drafted, and, and uh, we uh, were taken by train up to Oklahoma City, and where we stayed all night and had our physical the next morning. And uh, you know, uh, uh, this being the last civilian day, we went out and partied. The group of us partied the night before, and and we really hung one on. It was <laughs> quite a party. <laughs> I was in no physical shape to, to take a physical the, the next morning, <laughs> and, and I went through it. I never had any problems with it, my health in any way. And uh, and uh, uh, when I got through, they told me that I had a heart murmur, and that uh, I was classified as four M. Goodness, it couldn't be anything but that that party just caused my my heart to <laughs> act up a, a little bit, and they said it could be caused by bad tonsils. Maybe I ought to go home and have my tonsils out, and, and uh, they they'd call me later on for examination. And uh, it wasn't until 1943 then that I was called back. I didn't go down and try to volunteer because it couldn't pass the draft. A physical for the draft, you surely couldn't pass one for the Marines or the Navy. <laughs> and and uh, uh, I went to work up in in uh, the Oklahoma Ordinance, worked in, in Pryor, Oklahoma, uh, during that period of time. And what were your duties up there? I was working in the uh, payroll department. I was a, a, the uh, assistant director of the payroll division, and we worked with addressograph, motograph machines, the forerunners of the of the com <laughs> so-called computers now. Uh, what were they making then in prior? What? Uh, uh, ordnance materials, uh, firepower. Uh, it was uh, tremendous. There must have been 30,000 people hired up there. Uh, now, were they making the complete projectile? Or yes. Uh, uh, as I as I recall, I of course I had very little to do with what went on uh, out in the field, but they they were out. Uh, scattered all over a wide area of these things. Uh, it was the uh, DuPont in charge of it. They, they uh, were the owner of the, of the plant. And it was all done on a cost-plus basis, as I recall. And, and they had three or four plants, and you, they were worked in connection with one in Washington State, I know. Uh, maybe they were making the same material, or one was shipping part of it to, to the other other side. I just never was familiar exactly how that worked. But uh, in February of, of 1943, I was called back in, and, and uh, they asked me what branch of the service I'd like to go into, and I said, well, field artillery. I didn't ever think I could pass a flying physical if I couldn't, if I hadn't been able to pass one of these others. I, I would love to 
have uh, been a flying cadet, or you know, and uh, taken uh, been a pilot. But uh, they said, uh, well, they needed him in the Air Force, so I was assigned to Shepherd Field and uh, uh, got my training from there and, and passed the flying physical with, with flying colors, <laughs> so to speak. Tell me about your basic training at Shepherd. Basic training at Shepherd was, was uh, real. Uh, well, it wasn't really tough at all. Uh, we had our, uh, our 10 mile hikes and this, that, and the other, but uh, uh, I pretty soon learned the ways of, of how to get around in the Army and, and uh, got a job as a messenger for one of the one of the uh, uh, groups there and I had a bicycle that I, I could ride back and forth across the the compound and I didn't I had very little KP duty or anything else to do because I had a kind of a plush job there so you went into uh, uh, they, they, they put me in on flying status and uh, decided that I would make a good radio man and uh, uh, first I was sent to Arlington from there to uh, gunnery school, uh, Arlington Army Gunnery School and I, we did aerial gunnery work that was, a, that was the finest duty I ever had in, in the service. It was fun, really, I enjoyed it. What did you do? We learned how to uh, fire first of all, they, they taught you just like you were in a shooting gallery with a, with a little old uh, BB gun not knocking things off the shelf. Then they, they got you up to the 22 and, and then they uh, uh, taught you, uh, it was, uh, the, we had our 12 gauge shotguns and we'd shoot ski. First we, we started with trap shooting. And, and, uh, she, so that, you know, that's just what any kid w would like to do. And, and we went into skeet shooting. And then the, the biggest challenge of all after that was shooting skeet from a, from a mobile base. Have you ever tried anything like that? They got a quarter mile track and put you on the, on the uh, back end of a, of a flatbed truck with your shotgun. And there are, are 24 houses uh, stationed around that quarter mile track when the truck hits the eye, the electric eye, it sets the the, tra the skeet comes out. You don't know whether it's coming at you this way, going that way or that way, and you have to adjust and and uh, and uh, track it from there. And it's a challenge. I, I was tickled to death to hit an eight out of the 24 there on, on the round. But then they, then they put you with the machine guns and you had a Jeep uh, going around the track, it was this side of the track was 300 yards from me, and the other side was 500. And you try to put as many shells into that sleeve that that jeep was pulling as possible. And then you went airborne, and we uh, uh, did I don't know how many missions, but I'd never flown in a small plane even. And we were in the back end of an AT-6, I guess it was, AT-6 or something, AT-6, uh, and uh, had a machine gun on a on a mount there, and there'd be an air, airplane pulling a sleeve uh, down away from you there, and each of my shells had a certain color on it, and when we would fire it through there, you'd just count the number of holes in the sleeve with, with your color on it and grade you accordingly. But it was fun. I, I never enjoyed anything more in my life. How long were you there? About six weeks. Six weeks. Yeah. And from there? I went to uh, uh, to uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota to take my radio train. At which time I applied for for flight, for uh, uh, pilot training. and. Uh, by the time I had finished there, which was about six months after that, uh, we finished, mm, let's see, we left uh, radio school, it was, it was 
that's first of December, and we're shipped to Salt Lake City for reassignment, and we were assigned to overseas training in, in Colorado Springs at Peterson Field, and that was on Christmas Day when we start when we got into uh, Colorado Springs, and we trained there for oh uh, through March and into April, and went our crew then was. Uh, put together in, in Colorado Springs, or 10 men crew. And we uh, picked up a new plane in the uh, early part of April in Topeka, Kansas, and uh, flew from there to, to uh, West Palm Beach and took the southern route flying to uh, Trinidad and on down to uh, Fortaleza and Belém. Brazil, Fortaleza, and Natal. We went across, and we didn't have to stop at Ascension Island. Went right from there to Dakar, West Africa. So you flew to Africa. You flew over there, and then on up to uh, Oran and then uh, Oran and uh, Marrakesh, up in French Morocco, there. on over to Algiers. Tunis and on over into our eventual base at, at uh, uh, Manduria, Italy. Manduria, Italy. It was uh, a small town there on in the heel of the boot of mm -hmm. Italy, and uh, we were with the 450th bomb group there. Now, we are radio operators? A radio operator. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, would you describe basically your duties as the operator on the 17? B on B-24. B-24. B-24 has the two It has the twin fins. Twin yeah. fins, okay, that's right. Well, uh, my duty was to uh, uh, maintain contact with, with the base at all times. Uh, uh, after going into combat, though, they had only a lead radio operator and they only had a lead bomber. I don't know why they had to have bombers and radio operators on all the planes, except maybe in an emergency you get lost and away from the group or something. Uh, but uh, uh, we bombed pattern bombing off of the off the lead bomber and uh, the radio What's pattern bombing? Well, you fly in a formation, uh, and when the lead bomber drops his bombs, you're in a formation, and everybody else are just toggle ears. They just push the button and drop their bombs at the same time. So the bombs will fall in the pattern with which you were flying, see? And and uh, it gives them a, a pretty good spread over the over the area. So uh, they, as, as compared with the English pe uh, people, you see, they bombed at night. And they bombed individually every plane coming in from a from a different direction. Uh, I don't know how in the world they they kept from losing more planes than they did, but that was that was their approach to it. And uh, I've uh, you know being a prisoner of war, I, I've been through a few of the, of the bombings myself, and I, and uh, I know I've seen a lot of them, seen how they operated, and. Uh, uh, I think ours was the most effective way of, uh, of handling it. Did you make, did you maintain contact between the planes and the formation? We had uh, radio silence radio practically silence. all uh, on every mission from the start. See, we would form over the Adriatic. The Adriatic is a uh, large enough sea that when you get up 20,000 feet in the air, you can see Bulgaria over on one side and Italy over on the other. And you're in between two nations that are hostile to you. And we would, we would uh, form every day in the, in the middle of it and then head north, nobody knowing uh, who was watching us, know exactly where we're going because we always went in the same direction. And we veered off 
either to the east or to the west if we were going to bomb northern Italy or if we were uh, going to the east, well, we'd go into, or my first mission was to Floesti, the uh, oil fields and refineries there in, in Romania. It's not the Floesti raid, which was a low, low level bombing raid, but uh, my first uh, mission was it was to Floest, and we bombed it at, at uh, 20,000 feet. What was the date of that mission? It was, see, we got in there on the first day of May, 1944, and I would say it, it had to be around the third, third of May. I just had, I was on my ninth mission, eighth and ninth, they gave you, if you went far enough into to enemy territory where you, and we had missions that were uh, 10, 11 hours. Uh, they would give you credit for two missions, and we had to have 50 missions down there in the 15th Air Force before we could uh, come back. And the in the uh, 8th Air Force, all you had to have was 25. Uh, but uh, the, um, who in the formation had the order of where they were going? Well, they were all briefed. At, uh, at the briefing okay. in the morning as to where they were going and what the primary target would be and what the secondary tar target would be. Uh, radio men didn't attend those briefings, but the officers, the bombardiers and the navigators and, and the pilot and co-pilot attended those briefings and that we knew from the start where we were going. So did the enemy. It was amazing. We, on the, on the, uh, on the day that I was shot down, uh, Axis Sally came on the radio and said, Hello, you men of the 450th. We hope you have a pleasant flight today. We're going to be ready for you. And as you go over the new stat, and they already had the, had the message there. Oh, their, their intelligence was, was, uh, was great. I'm, I'll tell you, they do and as a prisoner of war, uh, I could tell them nothing when I went through their intelligence. There wasn't any, uh, anything new. And they told me this. I mean, it wasn't me thinking it. Uh, but see, I was uh, I was shot down on May the 24th, and my, I was shot through the leg. My leg was broken, and I had to be taken to a hospital. And the closest hospital was in in uh, uh, Stalag 17B in Krems, Austria. There we were uh, between, and where, where I was shot down was between, oh, pretty close to St. Poten, Austria. And uh, uh, so they took me up to this prison hospital in, in the Krems. <laughs> You, would you describe the mission you were shot down on? What happened? You were shot yeah. down? Um, our mission uh, to start off with, I have to lay a little groundwork because it'll, it'll later explain why uh, I was reported killed in action and, and uh, instead of missing in action. and. Uh, we start out, we go out on a, on the back end of a jeep, the whole crew does, and we pick up our, our parachutes and, and, uh, and take them into the plane. Uh, uh, on this particular mission, I don't know how it happened, but our parachute has stamped on, on it the individual's name. And I, I accidentally got a hold of Lieutenant Chetwood's parachute, had my own harness on him, got a hold of his parachute, and he got mine when we grabbed him off the jeep there. And uh, 
uh, we neither one knew it. We're, I realized this, but uh, our mission was to Wiener Neustadt, which is uh, just outside of Vienna. It's, uh, Neustadt means new city of, of Vienna, and there was an ME 109 factory supposed to be there, and we were we were to bomb this. Well, during the uh, during the mission, uh, we of course went up the Adriatic and then veered off to the east, and we were. Uh, approximately at a, approximately 11 o'clock we were off course and to the west of our, our course some uh, few hundred miles approximately I guess and we were uh, uh, we encountered flak over the city of Graz Austria which is in the southern part of Austria and we were hit by this flak and we were flying tail end Charlie or lower or left number seven, I, I believe it would be called. And uh, uh, as a result of, of uh, uh, this uh, uh, flak hitting us, I don't know whether we had engine trouble or what, but we were, we were trailing back uh, some little bit behind the, the group. Then we ran into a uh, force of ME 109s and, and uh, and uh, FW 170s. What's the 109? Uh, it's a Messerschmitt, uh, and the FW is a Falk Wolf. Uh, and uh, they are fi German fighter planes, the, the two uh, best fighters they had. And uh, uh, they attacked us from the front. Uh, coming at us, uh, I figured, it looked to me like they were about five across and five down, and they just put a wall of fire coming through your formation. Uh, uh, all, all guns firing, and, and you flew, they flew by you, uh, through you, and they knocked off the nose of our plane somewhere or other. I don't know whether the, uh, I never learned whether the flak was what got the nose of our plane, but in that encounter, the co-pilot and the bombardier and the navigator and the nose gunner were all killed. Uh, and uh, they would come back then past the group, turn around and come at us from the rear and attack us from the rear. And I was flying waste gun, uh, waste gunner, and uh, they would hide behind the tail fin. You know, when I'm firing at, at the rear, we have no cutoffs on our, on our machine guns to keep us from firing into our own uh, tail fins. So we had to be awfully careful about catching the planes that are coming in from the outside. And we had a formula, you know, when a, when a plane was attacking, he is formulating a track that comes right in consistent with the speed of the plane forward. And uh, we would put up, up fire, knowing that in order to make that arc, he had to come through that area. Uh, and uh, if he did, we'd, we'd hit him if we had enough rounds going out that way. So uh, uh, those planes would hide behind that tail fin, and about three of them get in a little circle. One would come in, and as soon as he'd go on by, we'd have to look for the next one to come in because if a gun, uh, plane didn't have his nose pointed towards you, he wasn't a threat to you and you just were concerned with the ones that were, were coming in at you. And, uh, and so you would, you would then pick up the next one coming in and you'd give him the lead according to your, your training and everything and, and, uh, and put up your wall of fire for him to come through. And uh, I think I was able to get one plane because his nose went up and and then he started down in a spin and could have been a diversion for me to keep watching down there so the other could come on in and, and fire, but I don't think it was. Uh, and, and, uh, but I couldn't follow him all the, way, all the way down to get a clear cut claim on one. But then uh, the next one that comes in, uh, he lets go, it must be a, a 20 millimeter uh, shell that explodes in our in the back end uh, section of our plane, and 
a lot of smoke in there. I uh, I feel a numbness in my leg, and uh, I'm still holding on to the spade grips of the of the plane. And uh, I keep on firing if the next plane or two comes in, and then all of a sudden there's a evidently the the electrical system was out, and and I I never heard a bailout or anything or no no warning. But the plane went into a flat spin. Well, I didn't have on my parachute. I just had on my harness, standing on a, a flak suit, and I had a, had a flak suit on. And I had to get rid of my my uh, uh, heated suit, undo my heated suit cord, undo my my uh, throat mic, undo my uh, uh, earphones and headsets, and. Uh, have to get a, all these things while the plane is going down in a flat spin, and I it threw me over. Fortunately, on my face, and I fell right over top of my parachute. And all I had to do was pull myself up, push myself up, and it had me pinned to the floor for a while there, and I couldn't get up. Finally, hit a pocket of air or something, and I was able to push up and, and just snap on this this parachute and turn over. I thought I had everything un, undone, uh, unhitched, and uh, I turned over and crawled to the escape hatch, which was back oh, behind me about uh, four to six feet, I'd say, in the floor. And uh, by that time, everybody else in the plane was gone, except one, the tail gunner, who was standing back behind, on the other side of the escape hatch, waiting for me to get out. And and uh, when I got to almost to the uh, escape hatch, just crawling on my stomach, I felt something tugging. I thought I had my my injured leg tangled up in that, uh, there's a coil of cable there that uh, uh, is for the, uh, you hook onto the injured gunner and let it pull his rip cord for him when you, when you throw him out of the plane. And come to find out later on, I had forgotten to un undo my my heated suit cord. <laughs> and I was just lucky enough that when I bailed out, pulled my rip cord, it, it snapped that that uh, heated suit cord right there at, at uh, my uh, foot on the left. And then uh, of course, I pulled my ripcord, and my whole worry was about hitting the ground, tearing up the leg that was already broken. And I, would, I don't know how high we were, but we were still pretty high. But as, as, as I floated down, you know, it went, the situation went from where there was nothing but just machine gun fire and blasting and, and just real, real hell there to the absolute deathly silence. There's nothing, no wind, because you don't hear the wind blowing, it's not blowing against anything. It's just absolute deathly silence. And uh, uh, I looked, kind of surveyed the territory down there, and all I could see was trees. I thought, well, that's, that's good. And then all those trees disappeared. And, uh, in the course of just a few minutes, it seemed like, and and uh, I began to maneuver my parachute a little bit, and and fortunately, uh, I saw a cabin down there on the side of the mountain, and uh, uh, I was able to loop my parachute over the top of a tall pine tree, and uh, I just just a small jerk, and I was swing right up against the body of this pine tree and there wasn't another limb clear down to the ground from, from where I was. How far? It, well, it must have been 10 or 15 feet below me. Uh, and all I had to do was reach out and grab the uh, tree. Meanwhile, though, on the way down, or while I was up in tree one, I was able to, uh, we had a first aid kit uh, up here in, on our parachute harness. I was able to open that up and get a little 
uh, morphine out and shoot myself with uh, through my suit uh, with a little morphine to kind of kill the pain. And uh, anyhow, I pulled myself up just a little bit and loosened the, uh, the parachute harness and slipped out of it. And uh, with two arms and one leg hanging around the tree, I was able to, to easily let myself down to the ground. But when I got to the ground, I was sitting on my buttocks. And I found out that right there how I could have just been killed if I had, had fallen that way uh, on the floor of the plane because I could not lift my right leg over my left leg to, it, it would just only lift up as far as the brake and just could, couldn't lift it any, lift the bottom part of it over the left leg to get on my knees and, and crawl. I thought, well, I'll just lift my right leg and my left leg over my right leg, but my foot was was laying out there, and as I as I turn into it, the foot would twist in, into the brake there, and, and there's no way I could stand that pain there. So I just uh, was able to just lay over on my back and rest for a little while, and it wasn't more than five five minutes. Okay, we're yeah. We uh, we'll take up. It seems that uh, when I was I was explaining that I, I had just uh, uh, sat down and was on was uh, sitting there and I uh, leaned back and laid down and tried to rest a little bit because of all of the exhaustion and uh, through this all and. Uh, I looked over my head and there was this house down in the valley and S2 had always told us that if we'd go and look for, for a friendly face, we could generally inland find a friendly face that would, would help us out. And I didn't know but what I might be bleeding to death with the bullet wound in the leg there. And uh, so I decided that I would try to crawl down to that house and get some help. And the only thing I could do wa was to to sort of give a backstroke and crawl with my elbows and my hands and push myself backward down the side of that hill uh, towards that, this house. Well, I had thought that I had been working for 30 minutes and I ought to be a good way down the way. And, and uh, all of a sudden I, I heard somebody say, halt, halt. And I immediately put my hands up in the air, and and uh, they came. I looked back over my head, and I was looking down the barrel of a German rifle. It looked like about a number two wash tub as I looked down at <laughs> him, and uh, and he uh, yelled pistola. Of course, I understood what he was talking about, and and uh, I shook my head no, I didn't have one, and. Uh, then he yelled the word kaput, kaput, and I didn't know that much German. I didn't know what, what he was talking about. He kept pointing at my leg and saying kaput, kaput, and I figured I better guess that he, it meant is it bad or something like that, and, and I, I said yes, and then they got up, and by that time they had four or five little German boys. They were about, oh, I'd say 13, 14 years old that had gathered in around the area. And uh, there were just two Germans with guns. Uh, so you got to understand that we are way inland there, and they had never been bombed in that area by, by the Americans or the English. We were about the snow line, or the, well, the it was watery, and it was the 24th of May, uh, and just uh, kind of damp where, where we came down. In the, I, I would call, have called it the Bavarian Alps, probably, but uh, uh, they, uh, these two German guards got the little boys together, 
and and uh, they were trying to make a pack saddle to carry me down the side of the hill or the mountain, and they couldn't do that, so they got two poles and uh, put some wooden pieces across the two poles and just made a stretcher for me, and uh, four little boys then carried me down the side of the mountain. And an interesting sidelight from that was this little blonde-headed boy, must have been 14 years old, on my right. When he'd catch the German guard not looking, he'd pat me on the shoulder and smile at me and, and uh, give me a nod like, I'm, I'm your friend. And uh, they carried me in to this little uh, beer tavern in the mountains there. Uh, and I was on exhibition there for the rest of the day. They pulled my boot off, which was fleece lined. It was an English uh, flying boot. And uh, I was shot just above where the boot came to in, in the leg. And uh, uh, it seemed that blood poured out of that fleece lined boot when they, when they took it off. Well, that meant I'd bled quite a little bit, but I think what happened was that in the cold temperature up there, that the wound clotted over rather fast. And uh, they, from time to time that they gave me from other flyers, uh, other prisoners' uh, medical kits, they gave me, uh, am I getting out of focus? Uh, gave me uh, some additional morphine to, to uh, uh, keep down the pain. I didn't really, the S2 had always told us not to, not to take anything to drink. They wanted to give me some snops. And I said no, and many times after that, I, I <laughs> wish I had taken them up on, on the deal. But uh, uh, I didn't have anything to eat or drink from 11, clock at will from the time I left the base until uh, that night about 11 o'clock. Well, let's get a little bit ahead of the story, but uh, from there, after dark, the German trucks came by, and there'd been several planes shot down in the area. And incidentally, to go back to why I was uh, reported killed in action and the, how the mix-up in the parachutes confused all of this, uh, I while I was hanging in that tree, uh, and before I got down to the ground, there was a loud crash, and and that was our plane uh, crashing into the into the ground someplace nearby, not necessarily nearby, because I never saw any of the members of our crew that survived after that date, and uh, uh, they found in in the wreckage of the plane, the parachute with my name on it. So they reported me missing, uh, me killed in action, being one of the bodies there in the plane. They found this parachute that I came down with in the tree, and it had Lieutenant Chetwood's name on it. And consequently, they carried him as missing in action for a year until they, he was finally reported killed. Uh, and uh, the timing also of the of the telegrams that my folks received here, they received on about uh, D-Day, I believe, it was around June the 6th, they received the first telegram saying that I was uh, missing in action. And then somewhere around the 1st of July, 1st to the 4th of July, having been previously reported missing in action, I was now reported uh, killed. That was when the message got through the, from the, the Red Cross, through the German intelligence of that crash and the parachute being found in the wreckage of the plane. And I had never been through, been interrogated uh, by the Dulag Luft, the interrogation center there in Frankfurt, Germany at that time. 
and I was I stayed in the in the PW camp there at at uh, Krems until I was able to travel, which was July the seventh, and at that time we were shipped back to Frankfurt to go through the interrogation center as t uh, a lieutenant and I that were shot down on the same mission. He was shot through the arm and I was shot through the leg and I was on crutches and, and he uh, was, his arm was in a big cast out there. Now were you in the hospital? And I was in the hospital area there and I, I have a little story if you've got a, sure. got a little time here, uh, which I call a, a little learning is a dangerous thing. I'd had 10 hours of French in college before I went into the service and I could pick up a little of the French and, and the doctors there in our PW camp were prisoners. One of them was a Polish doctor who spoke seven different languages and the other was a, a French doctor who spoke five different languages and they conversed back and forth in French. Well, the uh, all of the medical uh, uh, all the medical supplies were in short su supply uh, in the hospital there, but they put my leg in a cast and uh, it was uh, clear up to my thigh and fleas would get down inside my cast and bite there and I'd, I'd have to figure out a way I'd pull it away and, and I remembered from bathing my dog that the fleas didn't like water very much and I'd pour water down the top of that cast and kill those uh, to kill those fleas out and keep them from biting me. But but every time when the doctors would look at my leg and it had a window cut in the in the side of it of the cast there, uh, to where they could treat the wound. And uh, uh, they'd shake their head and say we're gonna have to take it off. And, and that's all I could pick up from their conversation. So one day, the med I was outside, it was summertime, and I was outside laying on the ground, my crutch is right there by me, and the medical orderly came, came up and said, uh, the doctors want to see you. And uh, I said, what do they want? And he said, well, they're going to take it off. And that's all I could get out of him. And uh, uh, so I began preparing my defense. You know, I lay, lay there at night and I could smell the wounds of these other uh, fellows around in that, that same room there that were uh, infected and, and uh, just, you, it was just terrible. But mine was seemed to be doing all right. And I said to the doctor, I said, doctor, is my wound infected? No, it's not infected. We just don't like the way it's doing. And uh, I said, well, I can't understand why you're going to take my leg off just because you don't like the way it's doing. He says, oh, no, not your leg, the cast. <laughs> so <laughs> a little learning is really a dangerous thing. Uh, but anyhow, they put on a new cast. They, they were, what is wrong, it was a little crooked in the cast. And they put on a new cast, and it took up nearly all of the plaster of Paris that they had left in the camp. And then it it still didn't suit them, but they didn't have enough because it was crooked in in the cast, and they didn't have a, enough plaster of Paris to put a new cast on. So they did one of the. Uh, they tell me in medical circles that it's it's just amazing this kind of an operation. They took, uh, uh, made a point on my cast there, uh, in about the middle of it, on the front and the back, and then they sawed out a little V shape, just halfway around on on the outside of it, and and just took that little chip out of the cast, put me over on my side, and. And I was laying on a table here on my side with my leg stretched out. And they got a man on top of there with no with no sedation whatsoever. And he started jumping on my, up and down on my, on my leg and the cast.
trying to break that cast and to break the leg at the same time. Well, I didn't have any brace under the top of the cast, and it, it was giving at the hip up here. And I yelled and screamed at them, and finally got them put, to put some books underneath the top of the cast. And they came down with one big jump then, and the thing just snapped out and closed up. They took a little piece of plaster of Paris and patched it up closed it and looked at it through the, through the, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, x-ray or whatever they had, uh, uh, and it was straightened out. And so far to this day, I have my leg, my right leg is five-eighths of an inch shorter than, than my left leg, but it's not enough to even give me a limp. Kind of gives me trouble with my spine being out of line a little bit and get sinus trouble, things like that. But uh, but uh, I think it's a, it's a marvelous, it was just the way they, they handled it, were able to handle it the way, and uh, take care of it. But, uh, but anyhow, uh, that left me on crutches when they were taking me back to the, to the Dulag Luft in, in Frankfurt. There was two felt labels. That's the, Where were you in the hospital? Uh, uh, was this the was at Stalag 17B in Krems, in the, in the prisoner of war hospital. How were you treated there? And I was treated very nicely. It was a very good camp, and I had good food because I traded my A2 flying jacket for a little. It was contraband; wasn't supposed to be uh, around, but a little uh, electrical hot plate. And they had even electrical plugs in in this hospital there, where where you could uh, <laughs> uh, plug in things, and I could trade. With, through my Re American Red Cross parcels, I could trade with the Frenchman who, who wandered around and had access to the kitchen, and uh, I traded for brown beans and at uh, one time, and and soaked them overnight in, in in water, and then cooked them all morning. Put it, bought a chunk of uh, French sausage bologna to season it with, and. Uh, by two o'clock that afternoon, I had the best dish of beans you ever, you ever tasted, <laughs> really. But it, uh, that was an exception, really. Uh, Red Cross parcels came to the, uh, if you received a hospital parcel, you get a, got a little different type than you got from the regular Red Cross parcel when you got them. And by that time, the, the Germans were getting pretty short on food, too. And we didn't get our Red Cross parcels, but about once every two weeks on the, on the average. And that meant that a Red Cross parcel was supposed to last you for a week. If you, if you spread it out, you could survive on, on that pretty well. But um, uh, we didn't always get the Red Cross parcels. And uh, anyhow, I'm getting a little bit ahead of my story. Uh, these two felt wables, the German sergeants, they were guards, who took us to uh, Frankfurt. Uh, we had to go on one train to St. Polten, Austria, where we caught the, uh, what is it, is it they call it, the uh, express, that uh, intercontinental train, the Oh, uh, goes from London clear across over the to the Orient, Orient Express. Express. The yes. Orient Express. We caught that there at uh, St. Polten on into Frankfurt. But we had to stay overnight in, in St. Polten to, uh, uh, in order to catch the train the next morning. The, there we were put in a, in a prison camp with Russian prisoners of war. We did our best to make ourselves understood with them, and uh, they were laboring out around uh, anti-aircraft installations there in St. Poten. And uh, as we marched down the streets of St. Poten one night, the Volkstrom, the People's Army, and all the soldiers, all smiles, to us, even waving at us as we, as we walked down the street, 
and into this PW can. And then the, at 11 o'clock the next day, the air raid sirens went on. And come to find out, they had never been hit by bombs in that area. That's why they were so friendly. They, nothing wrong. And they had moved this factory that was in Wiener Neustadt, semi-109 factory, down to to the uh, uh, St. Poulton area. There was an airstrip out there close by, and it was hit, supposed to be hidden back in there. And uh, the air raid sirens went off, and uh, uh, our guards were as anxious to get out of there as we were. So they grabbed us and took us, we hitched a ride on a half track down to the to the air raid shelter, which was a old three quarters of a mile a mile down the ra way underneath the airstrip. It was just a, kind of a cave that dug back in underneath the airstrip. And and uh, we were, I was laying, standing outside the outside the uh, uh, air raid shelter with all this group of German soldiers, German women, children, and uh, they uh, uh, were smiling and talking to us, and I was trying to tell them, you, you've never been bombed, you're not going to be bombed. And the first group went over, and the second group went over, and you could see the planes coming up off the, off the fields, and they'd go up, and I saw one plane go up, and it got into a cloud bank, and you heard, or you heard, you could hear all the awfulest pounding of, uh, of the machine gun fire. But he was in the clouds, just using up his bullets, and he came back down, and lands again. <laughs> you know, he, he didn't have to get into involved in it. But anyhow, uh, the third group had gone over, and I see, see there, they're not going, they're not going to bomb you. And then all of a sudden, out of a clear blue sky, comes a fourth group from down here. And you don't have to be told when the bomb bay doors open on it, even though they're up 20,000 feet, and the bombs start coming down. You can hear that, and it's coming down, and everybody started making a run for the for the air raid shelter. And I had leaned on my crutches in this marshy area, and it was, my crutches were bogged down <laughs> in in the area, and I was the last one into the into the air raid shelter totally dark in there and these bombs start hitting all around us and the screaming and the yelling and all, all that's going on in there it's just a wonder that somebody hadn't knifed us in the back two Americans and, and all of those Germans in there but I was standing just about in the doorway they're probably the strongest point in the, in the whole area but uh, uh, when we got out, the atmosphere was completely different. The old, old German Volkstrom member, you know, he's a guy who was probably a veteran of World War One or maybe even older, that the Home Guard, and, and uh, they had nothing but hatred in their eyes for, for us. And uh, the bombs, all all around, they had had really torn that place up. But um, the attitude, what, what I'm trying to say, that of the people was altogether different. And we went from there on in through the little town uh, headquarters area, and there was a little beer tavern where the Germans had been singing German songs the night before as we came through, and that building had been completely demolished. And just like in a movie, you'd see a flag that had been that had been standing in one corner had fallen over to the other corner, and probably the second floor and was draping down into the onto the first floor, a big swastika hanging down there, uh, just like a scene in a movie. And anyhow, we went back from there and on into into uh, Frankfurt. When we got off the train in Frankfurt, the guard the guards felt way were guarding us, put their machine guns on the crowd, not on us, and let us walk through the streets to the place we were going. 
but it's uh, that's how uh, the situation was. Frankfurt had been bombed that much that they had all that hatred for the for the American people. You see, and from there we went on to Wetzlar and West West Germany. But well, to, on, the, on the on the well, let me tell you just a little bit about the uh, by interrogation yeah. there by by the Germans. Uh, they put me in solitary confinement first. And then a major comes in and he says. Sergeant Rogers said, you're old news to us. He knew I gave him my name, rank, and serial number. He, he said, your bomb group down there, 450, said, you wouldn't know. But he said, they've got a new runway down there. You don't have to take off on one of those steel mat runways anymore and wonder which bump you're going to get airborne on. He said, you've got a new concrete runway down there. <laughs> He said, you wouldn't know about that because you've been a prisoner that long. And I said, you're old news, you can't tell us anything. That's how much they they knew about what was going on down down there around our camp. And uh, uh, so they, I wasn't there but about uh, two or three days, I guess. And they put us on a train to Wetzlar. Uh, and I don't know why, that, maybe that was for dispersal, but this was west of uh, Frankfurt. Then we went on a, another freight train uh, east to uh, across the uh, outskirts of Berlin and across to Stettin and northeast into Pomerania called to a place called Keep Haida. And uh, uh, this was Stalag Luft Four. It, it was west of the free city of Danzig, a certain amount, about halfway between Stettin and the free city of Danzig. And it's all in, well, that's in Poland now, part of Poland. It's all in Russian. Now, Danzig is like a Dansk? Dansk is it, what the, the, the current name for it is, Dansk, D-A-N-S-K. And uh, uh, we stayed there. See, I got there in, I guess, early part of, of uh, well, latter part of July. 44? Uh, 44. Uh, right after I got there, they, they moved the camp. It was Stalag Loop 6, which had been at, at uh, a place on farther east called... Uh, uh, what was the name of that town? Uh, Heidi Creek. And uh, uh, these prisoners were transferred by boat in a, a hold of a boat down there and then run all the way from the port where, where they landed someplace there, pretty close to our camp. They were run and jabbed with bayonets, the uh, Germans wanting to get the food off the backs of the knapsacks of the individuals and, and take them, uh, take it away from them. They're trying to get them to fall. If they did, they'd sick the dogs on, on them and get their food away from them. But uh, I saw one fella come in with 125 bayonet wounds up and down his back, and they were treating him on the inside of our camp. That uh, he'd been one of those stragglers, I guess. Uh, but uh, you know, when a man's got a gun at your back. If you want to smart off and and, uh, and give him trouble, you can make it hard on yourself. If you just keep your mouth shut and, and hold your feelings to yourself and don't yell and spout off anything, you can get along a whole lot a whole lot better. And I learned that pretty uh, pretty quick in there. But uh, uh, did you travel on the forty and eights? On the uh, 40 and 8 car, and there was about 50 or 51 of us in a 40 and 8 car uh, going across there. And uh, I found out real early because the, the American fighters were bombing, me, uh, were, were strafing these trains going through there, and they didn't know who had prison, um, American prisoners of war on them or whatever. And uh, we had that happen to us. Uh, we're in air raid alerts going down the track. 
uh, several times, but I had tied a, a blanket, made a hammock out of it, and one, one of those horse rings, you know, that they had in there to, to another, and I, during the uh, good times in the day, I'd lay up there in the hammock and get out of that crowd down on the floor. But the minute they'd, they'd uh, have an air raid alert, I'd get down in the middle of it with them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of uh, protect myself that much. How crowded was it in those train cars? Was so, it was so crowded that uh, you could barely sit down with your, with your knees up against you uh, when, when all of you were there. At night, sometimes you'd be that way. And uh, I've got some wild stories to tell about the times of night and everybody have to relieve themselves and they have a can that they pass back and forth in the dark to, to uh, and it spilled all over everybody. <laughs> it, was, it was really pitiful, but <laughs> it's laughable at, at, at this time, you know, how, how it all happened. But uh, uh, the uh, no, uh, really, they'd let you out maybe once or twice a day during the day because you weren't traveling all the time. They just couldn't get their trains through uh, these tracks. Uh, and you see, I traveled from on the trains from from uh, uh, Krems to Frankfurt to Wetzlar back across to to uh, Keep Haida and then back down to, to Barth from Keep Haida. So I had pretty well covered the whole country of Germany during during that time on 40 and 8, every time on 40 and 8 cars. Why, why did they move you around so much? Well, that just, when we left uh, Stalag Loop 4 there in Keep Haida, the Ru it was in January of 45, and the Russians were about to cut us off up there. The rest of the camp, I was still in the hospital area, and the, uh, the rest of the camp had to march out of there, and they were on the march during the latter part of January, all of February, and until the war was over, constantly on the march during the day. And they'd camp out at night. I don't know how in the world they survived that, that march, but I was I was put in the uh, into uh, 40 and 8 car, uh, the, all the hospital patients were, and we were shipped down. It took us eight days to uh, to get from Stettin, I mean from uh, Kipida to uh, Barth. Seven days to get to Stettin. It was a choke choke point there at, at Stettin. And then one day to get on up to, to Barth from there. But the Russians at night while we were parked on our side track and no engine on our train, we could hear the fire, machine gun fire, and one particular night they said, if we don't have an engine hooked on here within the next hour, we're, we're leaving you. And uh, unfortunately, or whatever you, they, uh, they did get an engine hooked up and, and we were able to be transferred on over to Barth, but in in Barth, uh, I had I had just gotten into a poker game and I don't smoke and I'd won all the the cigarettes in our compound practically, and uh, it was uh, uh, I was richest man in in the whole compound insofar as uh, cigarettes were money. You could buy food for for money for cigarettes, and. Uh, uh, I had enough food there stashed away that uh, from other people's Red Cross parcels that I'd traded for that I was set for the rest of the war. And two weeks after that, I was starving to death. I, when we had to had to transfer to to uh, Barth, why well, they said you can only take what you can carry. And of course, cigarettes were e easier to carry than uh, than food. And when I got to Barth, they didn't have any food. Down, uh, down there, and I lost from well, I got down to 95 pounds uh, in the camp there at uh, at uh, Bark. There's another story that uh, that uh, goes along with this a horse. They had the horses pulling the the uh, uh, wagons around that cleaned out the 
latrines, you know, and and uh, uh, a horse fell down in the snow and broke its leg outside our compound. And during this part of the uh, this time when we were the hungriest, the uh, horse this horse broke its leg outside, and we were getting a dishwater soup, just a cup of it, a day, plus two slices of black bread. And uh, if we had any any of our coffee left, we could heat up water and put our, our uh, powdered coffee into it, and that's all we had to to eat during the whole 24-hour period. And uh, so the commandant, I mean the camp commander, asked if they could bring that horse in and and uh, put it in our central cook shack and, and put it in our stew. And got permission to do that, and they butchered it. And the first time, now you got to understand that in each compound, there's four compounds in this camp, uh, in this uh, Stalag Luke 1. Uh, each compound had approximately 2,500 men in the compound. There was 10 barracks to the compound. Each barracks had uh, 10 rooms in them, and each man had, uh, each room had 24 men to the room. Then they had a barracks leader's room that had kept a few more uh, people in there. But uh, we had a very democratic organization the barracks leaders, the room leaders, and the compound leader. And the leaders dealt with, with the Germans directly. And so when they had this, the, the, that's one horse for 2,500 men approximately. You, you can understand that. So, so when uh, the uh, soup was issued, it was a pretty doggone good stew for us. We, we just really really loved that stew. And the next day, the bones were cooked over again, and it was it was still a little bit more tasteful, but the third day was back down to nothing. So the fourth day, they had a bone issue. Now, the way they had this bone issue, they divide the, the uh, uh, stacks of bones into ten stacks of bones for the, for the ten barracks. The barracks leaders come in and they draw a high card to see who gets the first choice of the bones. He takes his stack of bones back to the barracks and he divides those bones into ten pretty equal stacks. And the room leader comes in and he draws uh, for high card to see who gets the, the uh, particular stack of bones. By the time it came down to our room, we had 24 men and we had three bones there to chew on. And it was serious business, you know, the, the 24 men drawn for three bones. And the uh, uh, one one old boy by the name of Bill Schaffitzel from Springfield, Missouri, never shall forget this story, uh, drew the ace of spades and got this long choice bone. It was, it was uh, kind of makes my mouth water now to think about, <laughs> about it, uh, how good it looked at that time. And he was just tickled to death. And to hear this sad, he was about five, nine, I guess, Bill was. And you know, stealing food was a cardinal sin in a place like that. And they just didn't do that. But, but this big old boy by the name of Ed Shea, he's about six, two. And he kind of towered over Bill Schaffitzel. But there was, was Bill. I'm standing over there about where you are, and Bill's here chewing on this bone like this, you know, and chewing on this end. This other end is floating free in the breeze, and here's Bill right behind him, and that bone wiggling in front of his mouth all the time. And, and I can see him looking down at Bill and looking out and looking at that bone, and he couldn't resist it any, any longer. He leaned over and clamped down on on the other end of the bone, Bill cuts out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's all need to be said. <laughs> Ed J took off. That was the end of that story. <laughs> but just how pe people can get so much like dogs <laughs> when they get in a similar situation. What would you describe the barracks? In the, the barracks were 
Well, I think you could, if you have ever seen any of the uh, barracks here in in uh, the United States of the prisoners of war, they're just long, narrow, uh, rough buildings. Uh, they had uh, bunks three high, three deep, and scattered around so that there would be 24 men in each in each room. How many rooms? And there were ten rooms to the barracks. So how long was this building? And it was idea? quite quite lengthy. Uh, uh, and it would have uh, toilets at the at the end. And they had uh, they had what we called the V two for on on this uh, back end. It was a, a tank on the back on a wagon that these horses were pulling. And they would put down this uh, rubber hose underneath the underneath the uh, 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 bathrooms there, uh, latrines, and the guy that was operating the thing, it was ingenious. He would pump until he created a vacuum somewhere or other, and they lit a little, uh, put a match to something uh, alcohol or something up here and it released it and it caused an explosion and that would suck all of the all of the stuff up into the tank but every time one of those things went off boom it's kind of like a, a bomb going off everybody get jumpy one morning the, the Russians were always the, the ones that had to handle the American Flyers never did have to do any work, but the Russians did all of the latrine duty, and they were always laughing and smiling with us as they went by, and yak, yak, and this, that, and the other. Never will forget this one morning, bright and early, but it was, oh, in the spring of 45, and uh, these Russians were kind of lighthearted, uh, but the dew was on the ground, and, and we were just barely getting up, and we heard heard this explosion and looked out that we heard yak, 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 yak. <laughs> looked out the window <laughs> and there's this Russian out there he was wiping that stuff all off his face the, the, the rubber hose had broken <laughs> and he, he just covered with it. <laughs> oh, wild <laughs> but, um, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, that's just about all, except uh, uh, to tell you about when the uh, uh, when the war was just about over in the latter part of of uh, April. Uh, we had found where, uh, or somewhere or other, they had found where a Red Cross uh, uh, shipment had been uh, stuck on a on a side railing somewhere or other, and. Uh, we got a whole uh, train car load of Red Cross parcels, and each each man in camp got two Red Cross parcels, and uh, they were just really. Uh, that was when we needed it most because there wasn't any other food. And the, and the Germans were starving to death too at that time. They just didn't have have anything, and we and I thought sometimes we were eating better maybe than they were. But uh, uh, anyhow, that was just before the Russians came in. And the Russians found some cattle and butchered them when they came in. And, and but the, the, the funny thing about the, on May uh, May the first, when we were there by ourselves, we always had a radio. We had news every night. I was going to ask if you had yeah, the radio. Uh, uh, somewhere they had built a radio and put it inside the pocket of a GI coat. Somehow or other, and every time they'd come in to to search the barracks, the guy would put on his coat, take off, and we had better news. But we'd read the German newspapers, we'd get the BBC broadcast, and somewhere in between the two of them, we'd know the lines pretty well where the lines were. Uh, the uh, Germans never would agree until two or three days, four or five days down the line, that the Americans were. Had done what they said that they had done, and this, that, and the other. But, but anyhow, uh, we had the had the BBC tuned in, and we knew what was going on. 
on the radio. We knew the Russians were getting pretty close to to uh, our camp, and we're staying in there pretty close. And uh, just as the Russians were coming down the road, and I don't know whether you have watched Hogan's Heroes or not, but you know how they tunneled and did things like that. Well, we cut off pieces of wood off of the barracks. We'd pull the braces off and anything that wasn't absolutely necessary and, and cut it up and put it in for firewood there to keep warm in, in the wintertime. And uh, uh, some guys were standing on top of the barracks as the Russians were coming down the road, and they were yelling and cheering. And then that barracks just folded, <laughs> folded up. <laughs> it was that bear, you know. <laughs> but we, about that time, we got the uh, hit parade on BBC. And you know what the number one tune on the hit parade was? Don't fence me in. <laughs> How were you treated there, uh, the German guards, how they treat you? German guards, uh, some of them, uh, at this camp, we didn't have any trouble with any of the guards. At Keefe Haida, we had a guard we called Big Stoop, and another one we called Iron Cross, and those were the guards that the guys made sure were going to get it when, when the war was over. And I understood that somewhere along that that march, both of them died. Uh, so, you know. No, now, were you on the march? No, I wasn't on the march. See, I was putting the train and, and ship down, but these others were marching from, from January on through till, till April. And uh, towards the end of the war, they were getting, they, they tell me they were really getting jumpy and, and the guys were still being as tough and as mean as, as ever. And I heard that that they that they got them. I don't know. Um, now, what camp was were you in the last one? The last one was was Stalag Luft Four. No, oh, Stalag Luft One. I uh, we came out of Four to One. Right. Um. Where's One located? That's a bar. That's a bar. Yes. And four was at... At Keith Hyde. At Keith Hyde. I'm sure I'm right about okay. that. Uh, any other particular incidents at prison camp? Or um, well, uh, go a little further. You know how they... I mentioned how they uh, flew us out and flew us back to, to uh, uh, Reims, France, and then on in Camp Lucky Strike and, and on home from there. But, um, oh, uh, there were... Uh, uh, one particular incident around Christmas time 1944 the American Red Cross had sent Christmas parcels and we got our half parcel at Christmas and each one contained a scene back home and I know, I know the American Red Cross never thought about this when they were including that scene back home, but it caused more men to go crazy. They just flipped their lid at that time. We, we call it hit the wire. You, you got a warning track here, and you run past that warning track towards the fence, which is about 10, 10 yards away. You're, you're dead game out there, and they can shoot at you. So you didn't want to do that. When, when they flipped their lid, they, they'd head across, head for the wire. And uh, it was just pretty pretty sad time uh, during during that time. And the Germans, we were eating those parcels, and, and they made up excuses to come in and search your camp. And in the middle of the night, they, uh, one time in there, they, they uh, came in and cut up our mattresses, which were all straw mattresses, and uh, put our food down in the middle of the floor, poured it out, all in, uh, and had the lights on, then turned the lights off and, and left us that way for the rest of the night. Every, everything all piled up in the middle of the floor. And uh, uh, we put on 
we put on shows at at Christmas time so and what, New Year. Tell me about that. Uh, well, guys get together and and uh, some of them had uh, there was a little a few musical inter instruments furnished by the YMCA, I believe, uh, that sent some. Uh, well, this one guy had a an accordion that he learned how to play uh, while he was in, in the PW camp. And uh, he furnished all of the instrumental music, and we'd have a chorus, uh, our solos, and some guitars, and, and uh, uh, put on crazy acts, and, and uh, uh, just anything to uh, raise the morale. And this chap particular chaplain that was a minister of the Church of England, he saw the need to raise the morale of, of the people during this time. And, you know, everybody that was there, that their last mission was, a, was a, a catastrophe of some sort, and they had a tale to tell. And there's some wild tales that come out of it. You, 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 you could hardly believe some of them, but yet you, you knew they, they could be true. There's a lot, of, a lot of truth to them. Like the one fellow who was in a B-24 a tail gun, and he kept feeling his his uh, plane kind of swerve back and forth, and he thought that's that's unusual. So that it must be something wrong. I better get out of here. And he opened the door, back door to his tail turret, to get out, and there wasn't any plane there. He was just floating like a feather down. In, in that portion of the plane. Uh, I, I don't know whether he was high enough that he pulled his parachute and he jumped out and pulled his parachute and left that or, or whether he rode it on down. But I've heard similar st stories that make me believe that it, it's possible, you know, and uh, things like this. But this, this chaplain, he saw maybe the need for a little levity, maybe this is true, but he said, by the way, he says, did I ever tell you about the time when I was captured on North Africa? No, Padre, tell us. Oh, he said, why me? He said, it was rough. He said, uh, you know, said the shells were blasting to the left of me, and I was in my shell hole here, and as one would hit to the left of me, I'd pray, and then a shell would blast to the right of me, and it just so happened I had a little sacramental wine, and I'd, I'd take a little nip of mine sacramental wine, and a shell would blast to the left of me, and I'd pray, and to the right of me, and I'd dip on that wine. He says, you know, to this day, I can't really say which was doing me the most good. <laughs> Just as serious as all yeah. that. <laughs> Would you tell me your average day in prison camps? Average day? Your average day, what you did every day. We'd get up in the morning and have roll call. What that time? that it'd be oh somewhere around eight thirty nine o'clock. Uh, then we would, uh, uh, well, before that we'd probably have try to have a cup of coffee or something. Each one had to do it all individually, and uh, uh, the idea is the fellow that that could save his food and could last the longest. You know, the chow hound he wasn't going to survive. He ate up all his his food in one day and he'd starve the rest uh, the rest of the week you know and uh, uh, then we would uh, be sort of necessary that you go out and get a little exercise they wouldn't have any organized exercises for you uh, but uh, exercise was to walk around the perimeters of the camp inside inside the compound there they'd, they'd have within the the guardrail there, just walk. You'd see them walking all day long around there. And uh, oh, we had cards. We could we could play bridge. In fact, I I uh, taught a bunch of uh, the fellows in there to play bridge, and and uh, we'd have some real good bridge games before the year was over. We got to be pretty adept at our own system of bridge, and and uh, it's a wild game. But uh, then there, there wasn't much to read, wasn't anything like that. But you were constantly figuring out. And this one guy in my in my 
room, Vincent Gregorich from Stockton, California, had the most uh, interesting mind. He was just a born uh, engineer. Uh, I wouldn't have thought it possible. But we did get the German newspapers in there in the in the, our room, and the guys that read German could could uh, interpret them for us, and we learned a lot of, of the German language that way too. But uh, uh, he built a blower stove. Uh, now ordinarily, we'd just put our can of water up on the on the stove. And and let it heat that that water until it got hot enough for our for our coffee. Uh, our cans were built out of the out of the cans that came in the American Red Cross parcel. We'd flatten out and crimp the metal, the pieces together and make pans and make make cups and uh, this that and the other whatever. But he contrived a little blower stove which was about this wide, about this tall. It had a, an opening about a flue coming off the top about that big around. And in that top of that, he had holes for, well, uh, orange juice cans, frozen orange juice cans. We had a pate can that was about the same size, and it'd sit down in, in that, there were three holes in that flue. Now on the top of it was a uh, was a, a solid grate up here that we'd put our bread on and toast it there. But the heat there's a there's a grate here for the for the uh, fuel for the, the paper that we use for this floor stove. You could take one double page of a newspaper and boil these three cans of water and toast your toast with one double sheet of newspaper. Hmm. Now, isn't that isn't that making the maximum use yeah. out of, had it work, of your energy? How did it work? Any idea? I, I don't know, but all of it was concentrated up to here, and, and then it went out this this uh, this flue, yeah. and the water went all around. I mean, the heat went all around these cans that were sticking there in the flue, and what the it wasn't too much water in, inside each can, but it got got the cans that hot that it uh, did the job. I, I thought that was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could do something like that. And when when were uh, lights out or when was revelation, uh, not revelation, but retreat? Well, we retreat, we, we had a roll call again about, uh, oh, according to the time of year, but generally oh, 30 minutes to an hour before dark that they'd have uh, roll call, and we didn't have to in the in the hospital uh, barracks there, which we were in. Uh, it was just one room in this barracks. I think it was a hospital area, and we uh, uh, we didn't have to go out to roll call. We weren't first forced to go out, but the guards would come in and count noses, and we had this little old guard, and we really liked him. He was always Want to be friendly towards us, show us pictures of his children back home, and uh, he was happy to be there. He was he was old enough t to have been a World War One veteran. I don't know whether he was or not, but uh, you know you could tell how the war was going for the Germans by the age of the guards in the towers, and they got to be where they were old enough to be your grandfather. And they're pretty shaky on their on their trigger finger there, you know, in in uh, the uh, towers there, and you just didn't want to fool with them. They're just, just shaking, and then the least little event would would uh, cause them to set off a burst of shells at your way. Were you locked in the barracks at night? And we were locked in the barracks at night, and the, the windows were shuttered, closed. No way of getting out at night or wandering around. In Uh, what were your average meals in the prison camp? Average meals during the good times uh, were uh, some cartoffels, 
potatoes. Now, did you have breakfast? Uh, they didn't serve us breakfast. We'd have bread. They'd give us a couple of slices of bread for breakfast. We had any coffee there from a Red Cross parcel. We'd do that. And oh, in the morning, in good time, we got uh, some uh, barley. Sometimes it had worms in it, sometimes it didn't. But you just fished them out, and, and uh, in the bad times, though, it was, there wasn't a dog or a cat that lived around our compound. And let me tell you that a cat looks just like a, a rabbit when it's dressed, and uh, except for the tail. It's, it's just coming. And, you won't think about those things, but you do. You do a whole lot of things when you when you're hungry. And uh, no, we we wouldn't get a meal but twice a day at the, at the best times. And then the Red Cross parcel was supposed to do us for the rest of the time. We'd have in a Red Cross parcel we'd have a D bar, a can of salmon. Uh, if you didn't have a can of salmon, you'd have a can of tuna fish. That was one of the better packages that you'd get. Uh, you'd get a can of clem, K-L-I-M, it's milk spelled back backwards, uh, powdered milk. Uh, you'd have uh, uh, some K-ration crackers, uh, almost like uh, graham crackers, you know. and. Uh, you'd have some margarine, a can of margarine. There's enough that's supposed to last you for for a week, a, a full full ration of it. But let me tell you a story about uh, how this one fellow had saved up his rations, and he was going to have a cake. Of course, we had nothing to put in a cake to make it rise in any way. It was all just goo sitting there like a, well, might compare it to a brownie or something that, uh, uh, if you cooked it, it, but it would be soggy in, in the middle. What we'd, what this guy do is more compared to, uh, uh, I guess you can compare it to uh, Zwabak pie, chocolate, Zwabak pie. Uh, We'd make one of these uh, sheets or uh, pans uh, out of these tin cans, and we'd grate our D bar up into powder, just grate it up, and mix a little of this uh, powdered milk with it, water, uh, and and uh, put it into uh, into this pan. Then make a thick with the milk, make a thick cream topping to go over the top of it there. Oh, first of all, you'd, you'd grate up your, your crackers, your K-ration crackers, and put a little margin, margarine in with them and shape the, the pan with that. Then put your chocolate in there, and then your cream on, on top of it there. Set it out in the snow and let it chill for a few hours. And bring it in. You got you got a, a delicious treat there. Well, this no, old boy. What? Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. This old boy was in the barracks there, and, and uh, he was just whistling. He had saved all of his rations there in order to fix this pie. And uh, all of a sudden, he heard this V2 com <laughs> coming up the the uh, latrine machine there. And the horses were coming up, and just in time, look out the door and see the see the wagon run right over the top of his, his pie, right out there in the snow. You know? <laughs> he was sick. <laughs> what is a D bar? Uh, chocolate bar, semi-sweet chocolate. Uh, uh, that's the ration that the army army gave you. There. Also, I was going to ask, how did the, how did they build the radio? Uh, oh, they just. You know, you were able to bribe guards for a few things and get a get a few parts here and there, and maybe some of them had been able to uh, get parts or bring parts off of their plane with them some, somewhere, or get a, get parts taken with them. Now, was the camp all enlisted men? 
Oh, no, our, uh, the, the uh, air, uh, the Thalag Loops, which is the camp, prison camp for air, airmen, had officers and enlisted men all uh, uh, there in, at the same, in the same camp. And you say the Russians did all the work mainly? Yeah, well, uh, no American airmen were, because they were all, not, uh, they were all NCOs and officers. And you're not supposed to, under the Geneva Convention, you're not supposed to work an NCO or, or uh, an officer. And now the Army privates, EFCs, I think, had to uh, work out in the fields from what I, I could gather. But uh, I, there had been times we'd been tickled to death to go out and work in some farmer's field and let him feed us there, you know, for, for working. Uh, we'd, we'd have loved that. But, uh, you know. Tell me about being liberated. What happened? Well, I never will forget on uh, when, when we were liberated and we flew back into this base there at, at Reims, I walked off that plane and I could smell a GI mess hall. I could smell that coffee just as plainly and I just headed in that direction and found a found the mess hall open. And the uh, cook was obviously aware that the PWs were coming in, and he he had some hot bread there and some coffee that he fed us, and it was probably one of the better meals I ever had in my life. <laughs> it was just great. We just uh, you know you couldn't believe that that would taste that good. Now, you were liberated by the Russians? We were liberated by the Russians. Tell me about that. Well, when they uh, came in, this was on... The, Russian, the German guards were gone? The German guards were gone. They they left at midnight on April the 30th. The Russians didn't get in there into our camp until about 9 or 10 o'clock that evening of May 1st. And uh, uh, they kept us there until... I think it was the 13th of May that we flew out of there. This was after the 8th of May, which was VE Day, you see. And we never did get back into our own uh, country's hands until until the 13th of May. How were you treated by the Russians? The Russians treated us fairly well. They, like I said before, they went out and rounded up some just a little bit on uh, my navigator that was um, that exchanged parachutes with me was from Bellingham, Washington and his he was reported missing in action for a year and during that time his his mother died of heartbreak I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, my pilot our co-pilot rather lived in Sperry, Oklahoma, right outside Tulsa, and uh, his mother died of heartbreak within a year. You know, the casualties of war are, are not always just those on the, on the battlefield. And uh, my pilot is, uh, was uh, uh, Burt Baker, president of Commercial Bank over in, in Muskogee, and he's now president chairman of the board of the commercial bank. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually we had three of us from Oklahoma on that one one plane. What's his name in the scope? Uh, Bert, Bert Baker. Old Baker. Would you tell me the process of being flown out of uh, the camp? Okay, now, well they just took us by barracks and uh, and we just sort of stood in line as the plane got ready. Uh, they would load so many onto, uh, well, they were C-47s, as I recall, and uh, B-17s. There were so many people in that camp that had sworn that I'll never fly again as long as I live. You know, the last mission was a tragedy, and they'd always flown, had a parachute on when they flew. They would just take to death to get on that plane without a parachute. And, and fly back home. 
And I just kind of uh, sidelined there. Um, but uh, but that's the best I recall. Is just we just stood out there in, in line, and, and uh, they just uh, uh, took us so many to a plane, and we would take off down the runway and bring us back to uh, the area. We had to be deloused, you know, uh, there at uh, Rims, and I, and I really I think we were flown out of there uh, from Rims, that air, airfield in Rims, to. Uh, uh, lucky strike where we were. Now I've been back since that time, a couple, three years ago, went back into Austria to look. I want to, I still want to find the tree where I came down and, and, and landed. Uh, but the, the best I can recall, the name of the village was Kernhof, uh, where I landed. And I looked before I went to Europe, I looked all over the map of Austria, and I could not find that. And, and I don't know where I picked up this name Kernhoff, but it just stuck in the back of my mind. And and uh, anyhow, I did. Uh, as we were, we traveled, took rented a car from St. Polton, no, from Vienna, uh, and came east. On the east route is a, there was an autobahn going down to Graz. And uh, along the way, I found a little town there that looked like it might have been the one. It was on a Saturday afternoon, and uh, nobody spoke English in that town. And I was sitting in this little tavern and make, making myself known. I said, Kriegskafangen, and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, uh, he, he called up the English teacher there at the local high school and uh, told him he had a former Kriegsgefangen in there and, and uh, he wanted to talk to somebody and, and I, I talked to this guy and so and he had been an ME-109 pilot during World War II and I said you son of a bitch you might have been the one that shot me down <laughs> and, and, and he laughed he said well I've got a plane out there at the uh, at the airport said so I'd be glad to take you up for a ride and, I said, no, you had your chance with me. <laughs> I don't believe I'll go for that. <laughs> so you'll find out? Uh, no. Uh, we stayed all night in Graz at a very nice old hotel there in Graz that evening. And I had my whole family, well, my, my two daughters with me mm -hmm. and my wife. And we were just having a relaxing evening meal. And we were laughing because my daughter had, had wanted you know, they serve you a Coke, you got one cube of ice in it. And, and she kept saying mere ice until they brought her a great big salad bowl fill, filled up with ice cubes in there. I think it was all the ice they had, maybe. And we laughed about that and, and just joking there. And you never know who's speaking English and who's not uh, around you. But this particular man right over here on the left at the table next to us when he got up, he was obviously German, but he said, do you people always have this much fun at your meals? And we said, no, but this was a particularly festive occasion for us. And I told him all, all about this. And he says, well, I happen to have been an uh, anti-aircraft <laughs> gunner in this area. During. I said, you, saw you, you might have been the one. That, yeah. and, and he laughed. He'd been to the United States a couple of three times, uh, but he was very, very nice to us there. Uh, but on the way back, we took the West Road back towards Vienna, uh, Vienna. And as I hit the Audubon, the main Audubon, I looked down there and to the west of that, oh, about six or eight miles over there, was a town called Kernhoff, which shows that we must have been way off our course to the west, way to the west of, of Germany and Vienna, I mean of uh, Graz and Vienna. And uh, so uh, I made up my mind that we couldn't stop and go back there, but I, I want to go back. I can recall that little old beer tavern there in the in the hills. I'll bet it, it's still sitting back there. It couldn't have been too much built up around there. I want to go back and, and find it. From Reims, where'd you go? Uh, 
we went from Reims to Camp Lucky Strike. And the Camp Lucky Strike was kind of crowded and they were, they were trying to get people back as fast as they could on, on ships. And, and uh, so they offered us an opportunity to have 10 days in Paris or 10 days in London. Uh, and so we decided we would, uh, I, I decided that I could speak English better than I could French. I would, and I could make more points <laughs> in London than I could in Paris. I'd, I'd spend my time in, in London. And we went over there and, and uh, uh, had a good time. Uh, and I had a chance to go up to uh, Edinburgh. I had a free trip up there. Uh, but I was busy making the rounds of London, having a, having a ball. But then we shipped out of Liverpool back on the U.S. on the Argentina, what the USS Argentina, uh, and came back, landed at Norfolk, and. Uh, What's the first thing you did when you hit the states? Boy, I don't know. Kiss the ground, I think. Uh, best I can recall, and uh, we got off that gangplank, kissed the ground, and we, we put on a train and and uh, went by a train from. Norfolk to Fort Smith. Uh, I got in here on the 4th of July. Boy, the firecracker going off like it scared me to death. And when did you get your discharge? I uh, was supposed to uh, have a, I had 30 day leave and then I got 30-day extension. I was supposed to go down to for R and R down Miami Beach, and uh, by that time the war was over in in uh, Japan, so they transferred. They changed my orders and told me to go to San Antonio, report back to San Antonio for discharge. And I I got back down in San Antonio for oh around the first of October, I guess, when I finally wound up down there. And uh, I had a Class B pass. The second weekend in October was always the OU Texas football game. I hitchhiked from from uh, San Antonio up to Dallas to see the OU Texas football game. Ran across a bunch of people from Holdenville. They wanted me to come on home with them. We were just waiting around for discharge, and it was going to be a little while in yeah. I came on, had a friend with me from Iowa came on up here and he was going to go up to Iowa, pick up his car and drive back down through. We'd go to go back down to San Antonio and get discharged. And you know that son of a gun was gone two weeks before he got back. <laughs> there we were practically AWOL dur during that time. Uh, well, it was really with them. Eh? The war was over and, and if you wanted your discharge, you'd be there and you're not. Uh, if you weren't, well, you'd pick it up sometime later on. They'd call your name the next day. But the, the very next day after we got back down to the base, they, uh, they called my name. And uh, I was, that was on the uh, 31st of October, I believe, I was discharged. Yeah, 45. 45. But the Texas OU game, 45. Who won? You know, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I had a good time. I know all these people from Old Bill there, they were, they were Feed me drinks. If we were off camera, I'd tell you a good story about about what happened there. Let me turn this off. All right. This is. Okay. It show you just exactly what what you were thinking about at that time. Of course, I hadn't. I wasn't married when I was went into service, and we'd been in the PW camp all that time. I got on the. In the the uh, trolley there in in Dallas, they had a they had a streetcar that that took you right out to the Cotton Bowl from from the uh, Adolphus Hotel there, there in Dallas, and uh, everybody was packed. Everybody was facing the front, but I was one of the last one to get on, and I got up in the front of the streetcar, and I was facing the back. And this good looking blonde was in front of me and we were just like this packed in packed into that streetcar 
as we'd go down to the down the track, we'd, we'd rub, bump. <laughs> I was up there, <laughs> and I felt it coming up on me, you know. And, and, and it wasn't anything I could do. I moved, tried to get out, and turned my head, and I'd whistle. <laughs> I couldn't face that gal. She felt it. I know it could help it. But <laughs> Talk about life's embarrassing moments. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Well, after the army, you say you went to, you got your degree. Yes, I, I went back from, uh, uh, went over to Oklahoma University. Uh, to see about uh, enrolling in the second semester, and, and so, like I told you, the dean of the law school said, "Well, maybe you better check and see whether you really want to study or not, and see whether you're ready for law school." And, and I had enough hours to get into law school at the time, but uh, just one see I'd do, and I, I made good grades, and, and let me into law school, and we went summer and around the clock until I graduated in, in 48. And I came right back to Holdenville and set up my law practice. Holdenville. When Married in, in 49. 49. What's your wife's name? Uh, Sarah Jane. What was her name? She was uh, from Stillwater. I met her uh, at a conclave, fraternity conclave in Stillwater. In fact, I'd been, I'd been dating a sorority sister of hers and she'd gotten sick and I was supposed to be in Stillwater on that weekend and she asked if she could get somebody to substitute for her because she's going to have to go home and go to the doctor and, and uh, I met her that way and we I never dated the other girl since. <laughs> yeah, was her name Barry? Yeah, it was Sarah Jane Barry uh, of Stillwater. Her father was Lieutenant Governor James E. Barry. Okay, and what year did you take the bar exam? Uh, I took it uh, in 1948, when in uh, July of 48. Was it rough? Oh boy, that was the toughest examination I ever I had ever gone through. I believe that time, uh, and uh, I was wasn't one of those uh, cum laude students or anything. You know, they have a they have a, a scale in the law school, if you make A's, you make uh, professors. If you make B's, you make judges. If you make C's, you make lawyers. If you make D's, you make money. <laughs> so I, I fit in there someplace, I don't know where. <laughs> well, anything else about your time in the prison camps that um, any particular events or? I, oh, I overlooked a story or two. Um, I remember, remember one fellow from Medford, Massachusetts one time. No, he was, he was from New Jersey. He's a Jerseyite, making a statement, he just standing there and shaking his head. And he said, you know, there ain't no justice. And I said, what do you mean there ain't no justice? He said, well, when I got in this man's army, the judge told me, he said, you're either going to have to go to the army or you go to jail. He says, here I am in the army and in jail too. There just ain't no justice. Do <laughs> you have any, you ever reflect back? Oh, just in general? oh, I think so. Uh, it causes you to uh, maybe have a concern, like I was saying earlier uh, today to you, uh, for living for today and and protecting your life today, and you wonder, uh, like, what if this were true? If I were killed, what would I? Why am I left here on earth and these other boys were taken? I've been given uh, 40 years of 40, uh, three years of reprieve right now that are just extra added years to what might have been my life. And uh, you just hope, really, I, I think the person that's been in combat 
feels a, a very sincere, deep appreciation of his country, and, and and you see how those people live over there, and you just hope it never happens to the people of our country, or that they never are faced with a situation like that. And that's why I am such a uh, communist hater. I, uh, I believe we can live side by side with communism, but I, I, uh, I don't want to live side by side with them. I don't want them in my back door because they're always a threat. Uh, we have trouble enough keeping our, our uh, borders free of the, of the people that cross the rivers and come in now and, uh, and are not uh, uh, actually welcomed to our country. They, we just don't know what kind of people we're getting when, we, when, when they come in like that. And I feel that if we can stop uh, communism in Panama, Nicaragua, it's much better than stopping them in Mexico or letting them settle in Mexico with, with missiles pointed towards every city in the United States. I'm sure that a lot of people are aware of that, but not maybe as deeply as the people who've been out of power. But one story I want to tell you, and for the benefit of who all might be watching or listening to this, and it, I think it, it gives us a moral. I was not particularly noticed a young man who was in our in in my room, who was almost what you would have called in World War One shell shocked. His nerves were just at a brittle edge. He he, uh, you you could literally drop a pin and he'd jump. He had a he had a, a scar here 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 where he had been jabbed in the face with a pitchfork. He had a scar here where he had been uh, hit across the face with a scythe. He had a scar here where he had been smashed over the head with a shovel. He had been shot down over Budapest and, and uh, landed on the airfield that he was bombed. And he was so jumpy and I had to ask him one day, I said, don't you have a terrific hatred for those people? He said, hate them? No, no, I don't hate them. In fact, I don't know that I blame them. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I was taken to a hospital there in Budapest. And every morning, They'd bring in a little, <coughs> see, I'd be jarred out of my bed at night by the bombs, and they would bring in the next morning a little blonde-headed boy that you knew that would grow up someday, might be a football player if he only had two legs. And then, you know, the, the, the next morning they'd bring in a little blonde-headed girl that you knew her eyes would be blue if, they only, if she only had two eyes, and she, he said, you know, so, so people probably would have rather lived under the hell of Hitler than to see that happen from the American bombs to their children, and he said, it's going to take generations for them to ever forgive us for what all was brought about on them. You know, he's, he's got a point. I can't think of anything else. Well, I I really didn't get out my memoirs and, and uh, prepare for this like I should have probably, but uh, I do this as I recall it from time to time. and. and uh, you know, with with age, uh, the stories get bigger and and not not necessarily any more accurate than <laughs> than they they really were. But uh, 
I just feel like I'm lucky uh, to to even be alive uh, because uh, the, the good Lord Lord was looking after me and uh, saw me out of that out of that airplane, snapped that cord when when uh, I maybe panicked and, and could have been dragging drugged down a, along with the airplane into the end of that crash that it made. By the way, my tail gunner that I mentioned uh, was the story that comes to my mind on that and, and the mothers who might listen to this or see it will see what a little good intention by my mother uh, did and and where what happened as a result and I don't know whether who's at fault on this but uh, when we were in Topeka Kansas and picked up our new plane the crew went went down to my, my parents came to visit us and you ain't knowing that we we're going overseas from there and uh, when we were taking them to train to to send them back home we we're leaving the next day I uh, Orville Smith was there with me in the train and as my mother and dad said goodbye to us, he said to Smitty, he says, take care of my boy. And Smitty was the boy that was standing in the tail of the plane waiting for me to get out before uh, before he bailed out. Uh, he never was heard from after that. He was hurt. It looked to me like when he was bending over. All he had to do was, was fall out and bail out. But his body was found buried in Belgium. So we don't know what happened to him. I do, I do know that when he was brought back to the United States, I went back up to the little town of Lemon, South Dakota. And uh, he was on a memorial day. Asked his parents if I could go out and see the grave. And they told me where it was, and I went out there and cried like a baby. Just good friends, good buddies. Well, sir, I want to thank you. Well, you're quite welcome. Glad to do what your allowance and that it all accumulated there. Then we shot down before we ever got any R&R and, R and somebody, somebody had a good time with our liquor allowance, but we, we were always thinking positive, you know. <laughs> Kenneth Beckwith lives in Balco, Oklahoma, out in the Panhandle. Uh -huh. And he was shot down August 13th. August 13th. 1944. You know, B, what, camp, what camp was he taken to? B-24. And he was at... Oh, oh, oh. Loose Dialog 4. Loose Dialog 4. Uh, that's, that was uh, right there where, where we were. And you see this book right here that this fellow sent me. Uh, I'm sure the Shoe Leather Express refers to the march. And I, I just got it yesterday, so I haven't, haven't been able to read it. I'm sure it refers to the march that uh, uh, they made at uh, after leaving Stalag Lipko okay, uh, moving south. Mr. Beckwith said that when they were marched out of Stalag 4, he said that there are 11,000 prisoners marching west with German guards, and he said we marched 10 miles a day for 80 days back and forth to the American and Russian lines. Mm -hmm. And he said... Uh, uh, finally, it got down to just a couple hundred of his group, and he said, but they were marched back and forth every day to either escape the Russians or the Americans back and forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was, he says how many miles they marched. Two miles a day. But you can imagine what the conditions they had to live under, marching oh, yeah. in, in the dead of winter. And, and I saw it get down to 40 below zero. That's when I knew... I figured out when centigrade and and Fahrenheit right. coincide. That's right. Oh, uh, he said it's funny now. He said that uh, two American majors drove up, and he told the German guards to get them on the march west. 
and he said that they came to the Elbe River and there's an American MP directing traffic. And he said it was, they broke and ran. And he said there were about six groups. And he said there were about 3,000 field W's there. And everybody had to stop and pat, pat that MP on the back and we like to beat that poor kid to death. He said <laughs> every one of them. <laughs> yeah, 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 you bet. <laughs> Let's go, Lamb. And the right engine nacelle was completely aflame, burning like mad. And as it got about 50 to 100 feet above the runway, the whole thing fell out and hit on the runway. Well, you can imagine what a, well, you being a pilot yourself, what that would do to, uh, for the pilot to have to adjust. Mm -hmm. And he grabbed, that pilot grabbed that, that, uh, plane had it, had it completely under control all the whole time, landed it, did a ground loop, and and I don't know you, whether you realize how close the propellers are to the fuselage of, of uh, the plane, but that pilot, well, the, the other, other uh, uh, propeller was still turning when he jumped out of that, that plane uh, and hit the ground from his pilot compartment there, and it had to be between that, that uh, that uh, propeller and the, and the oh, fuselage, yeah. and, that was and he huge. hit it, hit the ground running, and sure enough, they got it, they got it all taken care of. That was in Algiers. That was in Algiers. Mm -hmm. I almost got killed in taking off the runway out of West Palm Beach. We were in that brand new plane, and 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 it just filled our wing tanks for the first time uh, with sufficient fuel to. Uh, get us down to Trinidad and we had gotten one minute on course and I had as radio man had already set down and let, let out my trailing wire antenna just to test and see if the radio was working and everything in good shape and I looked back in the bomb bay doors and there was gasoline pouring down in the in the bomb bay but about as thick as my thumb a stream of flowing down out of the, out of the wings down there. It had a Davis wing, your wing was up, up here. And looked out on the right side and there was gasoline flowing off the wings. And off the left side, gasoline flowing off the, off the wings. And I said, to crying out loud to the pilot, get this thing back in as quick as possible, turn off all, all the electrical equipment. And we shut her off and he did radio in for a straight in approach, emergency landing. We came back in there uh, looked out on both sides. There was ambulances, meat wagons, and fire wagons, all we could see coming down there. And the static electricity didn't get us because, I think, I forgot to roll in my railing wire antenna. It was back here and it grounded the plane way back there uh, behind the plane there. Mm -hmm. And there's no sparks to set off. You know, on takeoff and landing, that's when right. static electricity is most have to get you. Oh yeah, that's whenever we feel the helicopters. You know, you have that blade turning up there, mm -hmm. and uh, of course you have to ground the aircraft, and that is the number one number one rule. Mm -hmm. You don't do anything until you ground that aircraft, because mm -hmm. all the static electricity builds up mm -hmm. that prop up there. Mm -hmm. And even then, with that, we've had some incidents happen. Oh yeah, I don't know how many times in training that aircraft blew up on on takeoff. That was the worst thing about the B-24. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess... Uh, uh, just got mail from home. Mm -hmm. And this guy, his hometown was where they had a, a German VW camp. And he was reading along. He was, oh, no! No! What's wrong? Oh, you should listen to this. My mother said, I just got through baking a cake, which I'm taking out to the to the German PW camp. Said, I'm sure the German mothers are doing the same for you. <laughs> you know, there were quite a few of those camps here in Oklahoma. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw, I just recently saw a map of where they were scattered. But there's one down here around Stringtown, Toka, uh, that uh, 
work people all up in this area yeah. even. Uh, are you a member of the Historical Society? I have been off and on. I don't know uh, whether I am currently. We a had uh, the Chronicles of Oklahoma, or oh, what's been a, couple, a year or so ago, had an article of the German POW camps in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And it has a map and then had a description of each camp and what was going on. It was an interesting article. There was an article in the Chronicles of Oklahoma about the time that I was uh, announced killed in action. Uh, I better send back somewhere. Yeah, one thing I better do. We're making up a list of all the war dead from Oklahoma using the newspapers. Mm -hmm. So I better check that your <laughs> name may be on there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, who was it? Mark Twain or the report of my death had been grossly exaggerated. Yes. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask, what was your parents' reaction when they got the telegram that you were... Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, I can only tell you from what I've garnered from the people of the town here during that time that uh, uh, I was reported, right after I was reported killed in action, my uh, the friends of my dad who were lawyers in town here and the merchants on Main Street said he just looked like both my mother and father just looked like the living dead. They were they were just uh, wandering around in a state of shock and, and uh, they were had gone to visit a cousin of mine up in Stroud on the Sunday when uh, the telegram came uh, saying that I was prisoner of war and having been reported previously killed. Uh, and they got in the, in the door, came in the door of the house, and uh, turned on the light, never paid anything attention until one of them looked down and there was a telegram that had been slipped under the door. And and they picked it up and they, they were so relieved they started calling everybody and all the friends. Dad had already collected the insurance. <laughs> my my GI insurance on, him. <laughs> and he was only too happy to give it back <laughs> to to him. But uh, I've got uh, many letters in the file here someplace. He never threw anything away, and uh, where he had written to, or he wrote to every member of the family of every member of the crew, oh, on a regular basis, trying to find out if they'd heard any any of the news from any of their boys, you know. And, uh, not, not knowing for sure that that these five were all dead. And uh, uh, just trying to, they, they, this, for instance, this Shorty Mayor's ex-wife, he was in contact with her and fi until finally she said, I'd just appreciate if you wouldn't contact me anymore. I don't want to know anything more about it. Yeah. And uh, she was still bitter over the divorce, I think, if they had. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we're at St. Gregory's College, and this is the feast day of Pateri. That's correct. And Father Vincent, could you give us just a little back?